Canada. The major unmentioned issue in this election. Canada-US relations. Canada in a Trump world. And what should happen if there's a Trump 2.0? living in an age of political degeneracy and Canada is stuck between two degenerate leaderships. The United States on the one hand, obviously degenerate leadership, and the United Kingdom for reasons obvious. Who in the world is asking themselves, let's do it as the Brits are doing it today? Nobody. Uh, I say this as someone educated in the United Kingdom, lived there for three wonderful years, great colleagues, best universities, love the English language. Uh, two degenerate leaderships. What's Canada to do? Well, as I mentioned before, we're either going to have to think solidly for ourselves, which is uh, the path less traveled in Canadian history and very, very labor intensive, and we'll get to that in a second, or we'll become a remora to the degenerate sharks and comfortably slide into the colonial position and consolidate, as we happen to be doing, happen to have been doing over the last several years, consolidate the colonial posture. Except it's colonial posture to a degenerate empire in this case, not an enlightened empire, not one that's going to show us the way or lead the world. Indeed, to the extent that we consolidate the colonial posture in the context of degenerate empire, we will fall further and further behind in the world condition, yeah, given that these are declining increasingly degenerate empires. Big problem for Canada. How do we think for ourselves? Well, as I mentioned before, please don't take umbrage when I say think for ourselves because it posits the idea of thinking. And right now, Canada is not in a thinking posture. We're comfortable. We've been comfortable publicly for about 150 years, at least. Look at the man or woman on the street. Look at the discourse of the current election. It's all escapist, evasive themes that mostly have to do with nothing. Now, little about moving the country ahead and little about understanding the pressures in which we find ourselves. It's not, I'm not talking about foreign affairs here. You know, foreign affairs is very stupidly abstracted from the domestic condition. They're one and the same. You know, as I mentioned, the wrist uh, or the, 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 the hand punches with the torso. The torso might be the domestic constitution and the hand and the fingers, the external uh, force. They're connected. They're one and the same. So the degenerate examples that we have between the United States and the UK, United Kingdom, our historical allies and brethren, uh, impose themselves abrasively and, 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 and very weightily on the Canadian domestic condition and the reverse. So how do we think for ourselves? So it's more than just the habit of mind. I'm going to think for myself. It requires work on the Constitution. Let's get to the specifics because some uh, people have been asking me for them, and I've been writing about them for, for at least a decade. First point, independent analytics. We need our own school, school in terms of the, the ideological framework of school, school of Canadian strategic thinking. It needs to have its own vocabulary, its own institutions, its own literature, its own leadership and talent. Uh, and I would say one way of doing this is increasingly to push north, think of our northern geography that is uniquely Canadian uh, and it will force us to think on our own terms and to understand our own geography and conditions. Stress the French language as well because if, we're, if our American brethren are dominating us through the English language, particularly pressing through their superior platforms on social media in, in, in especially, uh, then the French language gives us a little more breathing room. If we can universalize the French language condition across the country, not just 18% bilingualism, but 80, 90, over time, 100 bilingualism, and then other languages, then we can create some breathing room for Canada to think for itself analytically in the context of Canadian school of international affairs or strategy, again, connecting the external and the domestic. So that's the general umbrella of the thinking. We need our own intelligence services externally. Uh, independent of all the major, including Western uh, intelligence service, a leading Canadian external affairs intelligence service that allows us to navigate our own circumstances. Otherwise, as I mentioned in my last lecture, if we have degenerate American leadership that has a degenerate relationship with its intelligence services, 
and we are beholden to both those intelligence services and that degenerate leadership. What on earth are we consuming? What is the basis of Canadian decision making domestically and internationally? It will be degenerate as well, but with a lag. Okay? It will not allow us to think for ourselves. So as I say quickly, we get beyond the uh, stubborn Canadian instinct to just say, yes, we are proud, uh, we are thinking for ourselves. No, we're not until we build the bulwark. Third point, USMCA. Thou shalt not sign USMCA. Well, we've already signed it. Thou shalt not ratify USMCA. Under no circumstances can we ratify USMCA, first with this presidency, which is a degenerate, untrustworthy presidency, and secondly, given Section 3210 of that um, trade agreement, which forbids us essentially from having any advanced relations with any country other than those that are preferred by the United States, starting, of course, with uh, uh, prohibition on, on advancing our relations with China. Now, let me return to the Chinese condition because it seems deeply misunderstood by a lot of our decision makers, even our top decision makers. The Chinese problem is largely a, a, an own goal by Canada. It is a goal on ourselves. It was generated by American pressure, which all of a sudden became hysterical about China in ways that were unfamiliar to Canada. Canada being itself very unfamiliar with modern China. We've not really known them at all in the modern condition of Canada. And all of a sudden we were required under some pressure, but really because the Americans held the pen and did the thinking to sign a trade agreement that forbade us from ever negotiating and, and concluding a free trade agreement with China ever, unless the Americans allow it, which means ever, never. Now, you might say, well, Canada's not about to negotiate a free trade agreement with China, especially given the, the, the arrests and counter-arrests between the, our, our, our two countries. And I would say, obviously. But again, let's think beyond our noses. It requires us to think deeply. Let's stretch the brain a little bit. How did this begin? It begins by the United States. Not be, does not begin with the arrests. Okay, let's get away from that. That's again our myopic, I would say, provincial thinking about the relationship, conditioned largely by consumption of American well, political lit literature and American uh, social media messaging. Uh, think for ourselves. It started by the fact that we cut at the knees any prospect of evolution in the Canada-China relationship at all, not just economically, across the board through USMCA. That allowed the arrest of Meng Wanzhou and the counter-arrests uh, of our two gentlemen, tragic counter-arrests, right, which put, which put a, a terrible human tragedy on, on a strategic uh, uh, bras, bras de fer. It, it, it made what was supposed to be extremely tactical into something largely strategic, existential between the two countries. Yeah. And that, that was our mistake because we didn't allow for any evolution after signing USMCA in the relationship with China. To get out of this, we must absolutely not ratify USMCA. Now, otherwise, we are completely vassalized to the United States, and that is the end of our two gentlemen in China and the end of any evolution w between us uh, in our relationship with the most important country of this century. And we must, after not refusing to ratify USMCA, uh, construct a larger deal with China in order to exit the tactical quandary and paint a picture of the future. That is to say, it cannot just be a prisoner exchange, and we certainly wouldn't do it under pressure. Uh, it needs to be something that gives us breathing room and paints a picture of the, of, of the future. So for Dominic Barton, the, the new Chinese um, uh, Canadian ambassador to China, I wish him well. His main project, whatever Ottawa dictates, is to reinsert oxygen into the relationship, open up the blocked arteries, First of all, have Xi Jinping and the, and the new Canadian Prime Minister, or the returning Canadian Prime Minister, I have no party at all, to speak publicly at a major uh, summit and say that we welcome travel from both sides. It's in the mutual interest to have the prisoner exchange, however you may call it, and to paint a picture of the future. It need not be a free trade agreement. It is a picture of the future between Canada and the United States as equals. And dare I say, much of this can happen through an Arctic architecture where there's plenty of room for collaboration and collaboration that plays on our two countries' strengths. Third point, language and media. I mentioned in past lectures and in many writings, writings that have been received well, that Canada cannot think for itself if we do, are denuded of a national vocabulary. 
in English and French alike, but particularly in English, our media, our politicians are not only quoting from American sources regularly, you looking for them, to, to them for cues and terms of, about what they ought to talk about, how they ought to talk about the, the moral intensity of the, of, of, the, of the content, but we are sounding like them. We are using Facebook language, we are uh, sounding either Trump-like or we're sounding Hillary or Bernie Sanders-like. Uh, but if they are part of the degenerate condition, then what are we if we are just aping them? And we are the only country in the world that is literally aping them without even reflecting on it. And that's because we are denuded of our own literature and vocabulary. So it behooves the next government, under pressure of a potential Trump 2.0, which we'll discuss in a second, to invest in institutions of media, of literature, of art, of language, of education in Canada that can allow us to think for ourselves, starting with language, concepts, and a frame of mind that says, you know what, uh, that's an interesting American article, but you know what, that's an interesting article from China, that's an interesting article from Japan, that's one from France, I'll put it together, I'll think for myself. I won't just naively uh, accept what AOC or Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump or, or Lindsey Graham says or say. You know, that is lazy thinking. And I certainly won't just repost everything because they control the terms of the algorithm. You know, please stop reposting just random American articles and say, you know what, that's the shit. That's, that's, the, that's the apex of, the, of, of human wisdom or as, as, as the distinguished American president would say, uh, the height of human wisdom or unlimited human wisdom. That's degenerate behavior, uh, aping degenerate behavior. And where does that put us as a country? So invest in language, institutions, and media. Bigger, better, more prolific. Including, as I mentioned before, the CBC. Uh, fourth or fifth point, I forgot where I was. Arctic. What are we going to do in the Arctic? Okay. In a Trump 2.0 scenario, imagine that he should survive. Imagine that he'll survive not just impeachment, but be re-elected. What are we going to do in the Arctic? You know, if I'm Donald Trump and I'm re-elected, I'm so emboldened uh, and so not only capricious at this point, but so non borné, I'm devoid of, of any limits to my behavior. I'm, I'm the king now, right? It doesn't matter that I'm in a democratic context. And if the Arctic becomes the major issue, as it inevitably must, in the, both in the context of, 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 of the warming of the Arctic, the opening up of, of, of not just the Northwest Passage, the, uh, the Northern Sea Route, but <coughs> all of the Arctic territory comes up for grabs in terms of just the, the, the overall human project, the regulatory project. If I'm Donald Trump, I'll say there's a country there, but it's nominally Canada. I might just come close to taking it or parts of it. You have annexation scenarios that have been, that have been preordained by behaviors of, of other countries, including Arctic countries. And if I'm Donald Trump, that is part of my, uh, that, that is my part of my uh, composition of, 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 of options and options that, that bloodthirsty or, or rapacious analysts might put to him. And it might be seductive in the context of no Canadian resistance. Have we thought about that? Has anybody in this election so far talked about Arctic scenarios in the context of climate change? You know, what are we talking about climate change, these abstract ideas of, of Canada somehow changing the, the course of global climate uh, through behavior along the southern border while yielding essentially the top 40% to, to the fortunes or to the rapacious leaders of other countries? What are we doing if we're a serious people? We need to have an Arctic plan, 25-year plan, 50-year plan as serious people. That's demographic, scientific economic, environmental, military, intelligence, diplomatic, and so on, and overall regulatory. And as I mentioned before, we could change the world with a major Arctic uh, agenda that thinks uh, uh, the positions Canada as a, as a term setter, and indeed a, a place like Whitehorse, or Yellowknife, or Inuvik as, as a Singapore, Singaporean-like hub in the overall Arctic, which connects many, many of the, the great continents of the world. Two more points. Relationships, relationships, relationships. If we're surrounded by two degenerate empires, you know, one already sunk and the other one uh, eroding, we must not say that we are uh, not going to do business with what we call 
the thugs of China, the thugs of Russia, the thugs of Iran, the thugs of Saudi Arabia. I mean, we're calling everyone thugs, and now the Americans are thugs, so we're surrounded by thugs, right? as, as we like to say in certain newspapers uh, led by people who know very little. If they're thugs, then what are we? Are, they're thugs, then we're bumpkins, right? Which one's better? I'm not sure either, either is better. If we're surrounded by thugs, and I don't agree with that language for any of these countries, these are major countries, in many cases our neighbors, or they're term-setting countries with their own leaderships and interests. We're surrounded by difficult countries with difficult borders. These are classic strategic scenarios for, for, for uh, most countries around the world. Canada has just not known them in, in, in our 150 years. What do we do? We must think. And the first thinking strategy must be to have good relationships with all of them. Right? Because if we have bad relationships with all of them and they're immediately at our borders and they're bigger and more wicked than us, we are done. So we must be Israeli and Singapore-like. And we must think for ourselves. We must promiscuously have relationships with all of them and use them to our advantage. And hopefully our advantage is well-intentioned. But first, it starts from an existential posture, okay? not from a moral posture. Okay. Last point, the quality of our, our leaders. It is low. It is unacceptably low. Yeah. We do not have enough leaders, including in this election, that are promising to move the country in a meaningful direction, whatever one's party, whatever one's ideology. The country is not moving given its circumstances. We have wicked pressures at the gates. We have inadequate assets uh, in the belly, in the constitution. And we have uh, a leadership class that is either too comfortable, uh, too naive, I talked about the bumpkin class, does not have the requisite vocabulary to even pose the question, and will not know how to react if these pressures should ramp up. If the China-America pressure at our borders and us stuck between the, the two giants should ramp up, what is our national reaction? So far, it's been inadequate. right? If we don't prepare, if we don't think about it and, and develop the relationships of vocabulary and certainly the leadership mentality, we will sink. What happens if there's a Russia-America or Russia-China pressure at our, at, at, our, at our frontiers, on us. Will we know what to do? And of course, what, should, what if it should happen from our oldest and bestest, bestest friend, the United States, as I su suggested in, in, a, in a past micro lecture? Yeah. We trust them today. We're in denial if we think that they will defend us at every step. And we certainly are in denial if we don't have, at least as a scenario, that in some cases they may outright betray us, particularly in an out Arctic scenario because we've naively identified ourselves, not just in terms of interest, but, but almost morally with the United States, we are one. Yeah. To hell with that, we're not one. We are both distinguished peoples, old countries. We must face them mano a mano as a, a, an adult country with a leadership class that is a la hauteur. Yeah. Otherwise, we won't last very long. But if we do, we have a great century ahead of us. Thank you.